After last week's episode brought us to the midpoint of the series, we are now over the hill and on the downward push towards the finale of Shogun, as all of the pieces are moving into place for the final grand confrontation. Now, as most of you already know, I've had mixed feelings on the series so far. Although there is a lot I am liking about it, there are also complaints I do have. Yet, to gauge what you are all thinking so far, I did put out a poll last week, and it is very clear that the vast majority of you are indeed loving the show. This is great, I'm glad the show is getting so much praise and affection. I know it may seem like I can be a bit harsh on it, but that does not mean that I'm not happy that people are really enjoying it. There is certainly a lot to like about the show, paramount for me being the historical attention to detail on display. I just hope that the show continues to be good and that it sticks the landing in the end. And on the topic of historical accuracy, I also want to say that within the next couple of days, I'll be uploading an interview with an actual historical consultant for the show, Frederick Cranes. Now, I personally had no part in this interview, as it was actually conducted by Anthony Cummins, who has been doing his own reviews of the series as well. But Anthony reached out to me and asked if I would like to put the interview on my channel instead, just to help more people see it and get a better idea about the tremendous amount of effort that went into the show being as historically accurate as possible. There are so many awesome details they get into in this interview, I can't wait to share it with you all. So keep an eye out for when that video goes live. But with that out of the way, let us get on to this week's review. And as always, there will be spoilers ahead. Episode 6 is titled, Ladies of the Willow World. This episode was very interesting, and I have to say that I think I enjoyed it more than the prior two being that the stakes are continually rising and the drama is reaching new heights. But there are also a number of historical details they touch on as well, not to mention details they change. So, let's get into it. The episode opens with a flashback to when Mariko and the Lady Ochiba were children. I don't think I've touched on Lady Ochiba at all in my reviews yet. We've seen her very sparsely, but it's really here in this episode that she truly starts to get a lot of screen time. The Lady Ochiba is of course the mother of the Taiko's young son. She had been a concubine to the Taiko and obviously not his wife, who was of course Lady Io. However, since the Taiko had tremendous difficulty conceiving a son, he had to turn to a concubine in order to hopefully have a proper heir. So who are these two women actually based on historically? Well, the Lady Io is based on the Lady Nene and from what it seems, most of what we are shown of her lines up pretty well with history. However, the character of Ochiba is very different. Ochiba in real history was known as the Lady Chacha, but perhaps more famously as Yoro Dono. And I will say the differences they made here I don't think are actually bad. In real history, Yoro Dono was the daughter of Azai Nagamasa and the Lady Oichi, who was the sister of Oda Nobunaga, the first great unifier known in Shogun as Kuroda. Yet here in Shogun, it appears as though they made a significant change and instead made her out to be the actual daughter of Kuroda, the first great unifier, herself. I honestly don't remember if this was the case in the book as well. I don't think it was, but regardless, I think that this change is actually a very interesting one because it creates a fascinating angle of revenge which is at play. This is the main story element that, so far I think, sets the overall story of this adaptation of Shogun apart from the book. A change that makes this story its own, and one that I actually like the more I think about it. Because in this initial flashback, we are shown that Mariko and Ochiba grew up together as very close friends, only to then later have both of their worlds come crashing down as Ochiba's father is slain by Mariko's father. On the surface, we can see how this is a story of samurai lords engaging in political maneuvering and violence, but in the midst of it all, to varying levels of influence, are two women who are on their own path for vengeance, both of them for the deaths of their fathers which caused their lives to turn into torturous existences as both were forced to endure terrible hardships. Yet both of them obviously want very different things. Ochiba obviously wants the respect and power that would be hers if her father Kuroda would have lived, something which she can gain through her son. And Mariko, who instead knew that what her father Akechi Jinsai did in killing the first great unifier was an act of justice, being that Kuroda was a cruel and ruthless overlord. She wants revenge for the fact that this act of seemingly righteousness in killing him was met with her own family being eradicated. This is an incredible twist that I did not see coming, and I hope they will continue to lean more and more into it as this show progresses. 
Yet, like I said, we spend a lot of time with Ochiba in this episode, as she is now in Osaka. We saw her arrival at the end of the previous episode, and it was portrayed as almost the arrival of a villain. Ochiba is treated like the real threat here. She has a hatred for Toranaga and wants to ensure that her son is well protected so that he can grow up to rule the land. Like I said, this is her form of revenge for how she suffered. And you can see the imposing presence she has over everyone. I love the way she is portrayed. I think they nailed her with the actress and demeanor she displays. You can tell how much influence she has over who we thought was the real villain in Ishido. However, we have to remember, she is the mother of the future ruler of Japan. She can significantly influence her child, and if Ishido does not please her, he could find out that his own position is on the line. This is how the real Yorodono is often portrayed in the later conflict at Osaka, which would amount to the Great Siege of Osaka from 1614 to 1615. To be honest, I don't know how much of a role she personally played here in the build-up to the Battle of Sekigahara. There was plenty of maneuvering around the air with figures trying to appear as his guardian, but most popular historical references don't seem to start to paint Yorodono as the real conniving schemer behind the scenes until years later. Either way, I do really like how they are positioning Ochiba for the show. Now, the council is in disarray. Ishido wants to go after Toranaga. He wants war, but he needs the full support of the council, which sadly he does not have, even when he thinks he does. He tries to bring on Lord Ito to replace Toranaga, and I think they do a really fantastic job here using no theater to show the life story of the Taiko and eventually his relationship with Ochiba. Lord Ito is seen to be playing the character of the Taiko in the play. This is an awesome historical detail as samurai lords would often take part in theatrical events like this, either through their own free will or sometimes forcibly. Ito is seen to be a bit of a lackey. You can tell he is ready for peacetime and just wants to be an actor, which makes him easy prey for Ishido who then tries to recruit him to the council, only to then be challenged by another regent, Sugiyama. Ishido then has Sugiyama killed, but blames it on bandits. So now there is another empty council position that Ishido needs to fill with another loyal yes man. But as all of this is happening in Osaka, what is going on in Anjiro? Well, not a whole lot. People are still recovering from the earthquake in the prior episode, but not Fujiko who seems to have made a complete recovery. In the book, her recovery takes a lot longer as I mentioned before, and is used to create great bonding moments between herself and Blackthorn. So it is a bummer to see that this might be cut, but anyways. To thank Blackthorn for saving his life, Toranaga promotes him once again, now making him his admiral and giving him full command over the cannon regiment he has been training. Yet Blackthorn still wants out. He either wants to fully leave Japan or to be given clearance to go and attack the Portuguese, neither of which Toranaga is interested in. And it's here I'm sad to say that I have to comment again about how I just feel that the characters and their interactions just don't feel right, at least not for me. The friendship and growing bond between Toranaga and Blackthorn is another key element in the book, something which plays a massive role in the end of the story. By this point in the book they've had lots of moments to grow closer as friends. Yet, here in the show, really the only moment of casual friendship we've seen between the two of them has just been that scene with the diving and swimming. For every other interaction, they seem to be almost cold and stiff with each other, with Blackthorn not sure how to react to anything Toranaga says or does, and Toranaga disinterested with anything Blackthorn has to say. It's just a bit of a disappointment that these two are not further along in their own development. Another interesting relationship continues to be that between Blackthorn and Mariko, which so far in the show has had its ups and downs. The effects of the altercation from the previous episode are still fresh in everyone's mind, and I like the bit of extra detail we get from Buntaro. Buntaro, Mariko's husband who beat her in the previous episode, is questioned by Toranaga about why he does not just divorce her, to which he replies that he can't. Deep down, Buntaro, for all of his awful behavior, does still love her despite the fact that she has never shown him any love and affection. He mentions how she continually pleaded with him to allow her to take her own life because of what happened to her own family, but that he has repeatedly refused her. Thus, she has always been icy to him, and as he says, the ice has never melted. What makes things worse now is that Blackthorn is being thrown in the mix. As another gift for saving his life and also to help get his mind off of things, Toranaga sends Blackthorn to see Kikusan, a courtesan someone who is of the Willow world as it is described. Yet Toranaga also sends Mariko too so that she can translate. The whole evening is pretty awkward between everyone, which is the complete opposite to the book where everyone is laughing and having a great time. Here the tension is palpable, and Kiku can see right through the difficult relationship between Blackthorn and Mariko. 
and then proceeds to offer them a place where they can be together in private for the night. Now, we are not shown what happens next and who Blackthorn does end up spending the night with, but in the book, and I imagine here in the show as well, that yes, he does actually spend the night again with Mariko. The show is really starting to push Blackthorn and Mariko together now romantically, and although for me personally it does feel a bit forced, I think there is still enough time left in the series to make it all work out with proper feeling and emotion. The last thing I will talk about is that we finally get mention of Crimson Sky. So, with Ochiba and Ishido really clamping down heavily in Osaka by burning the messenger bird building, Toda Hiramatsu is forced to go by himself to relay news of the developments. It's here Todanaga's War Council has a meeting in which they debate ordering Crimson Sky, which is a codename for Todanaga's grand push westward to crush Ishido, seize Osaka, and establish a new government. And although Todanaga is still a bit on the fence regarding it, it's clear by the end that this is the route that Todanaga is likely going to be pursuing. And just like in the book, Toranaga continues to deny that he has any interest in becoming Shogun if he is victorious. However, what is important for everyone to remember is the three hearts. It was mentioned earlier in the series that the Japanese think that everyone has three hearts. One which they share to everyone, one which they share just for their close friends and family, and one just for themselves. It's important to keep in mind that everything we see about Toranaga is obviously different beneath the surface. He has not revealed what he truly desires. Alright, so as I mentioned at the start, I think that this episode was pretty good. It picked things back up from the low point I thought the show was dropping to in the prior episodes, and things are starting to come together. As I said, I really like the change they made to Ochiba's character and how it relates to Mariko, and I really hope that this tension is something they continue to build up because it could be really fascinating to see how it all plays out. I am hopeful looking forward to future episodes, because when all is said and done, I do enjoy this adaptation so far, despite the gripes I've had. What I will continue to say though is that I sincerely hope they can stick the landing and pull it all off. Obviously, each of these final four upcoming episodes will be critical. But with that said, what do you think? Did you like the episode? Did you dislike it? Do you agree or disagree with anything I said? Let me know in the comments below. And keep an eye out for the upcoming interview with the show's historical consultant, which will be posted within the next couple of days. Thank you for watching, and don't forget to like, subscribe, and ring that notification bell if you enjoyed this video and found it to be most interesting.